In this special NHL Trade Deadline 2021 special, we gather our experts from the biggest selling markets in the league to discuss who is on the block and what impact a trade with those players from their organizations would be. From the Devils, the Canucks, Ducks, Sabres, Kings, Sharks, Blue Jackets, seven teams. We also talk Vancouver Canucks dealing with COVID and if they might be playing a shortened season. Hit the music. Welcome to Jablam Sports Hockey, folks. I'm your host, Peter Bronjaranov, and the mic is always on. You can find me on Twitter, at Russia98. You can find the full show, at Jablam Sports. If you have any questions or comments, please tweet us. Use the hashtag Jablam Sports. That's J-A-B-L-A-M Sports. Please subscribe to us if you haven't done so yet, and click on the three dots in your podcasting app. Share our show with three hockey fans you know. Thank you, everyone. Remember, check out our website, go to jablamsports.com, see all our podcasts, and even game notes for each episode. You'll get links to all the things we mentioned on this show, including guests. For our podcasts, click on podcasts, and then hockey on this show specifically right on our website. Before we get into what everybody's excited about, I'm not one to bury the lead. It was about a week ago today, I messaged my pal, Jeff. Jeff Patterson. Jeff and I texted last week about what the Canucks could be looking at moving. We had a few exchanges about maybe Tanner Pearson, but he's injured. But life has flipped upside down on the West Coast. The city and the team are really dealing with a big health problem, obviously, with the pandemic. Jeff, what's the update with the Canucks and COVID? Yeah, we're all just in a a holding pattern out here, waiting for the hockey club and the National Hockey League and the various health officials as well to sort of figure out where the Canucks are in the midst of this massive outbreak that has, you know, affected more than 20 members of the organization, players, taxi squad members, coaching staff. Uh, We think that it's been limited to players and coaches and that it hasn't impacted trainers and athletic therapists and public relations people, uh, those, but you know, they're in constant contact with the players on a daily basis. Now Rogers arena has been a no go zone for uh, five or six days now, uh, other than the players uh, that still have to come in and, and get their daily test, but they've got it in an underground parkade. It's a drive through, you know, these guys are never getting anywhere close to the locker room. Now they're not seeing each other. Uh, so they come in, they get tested on a daily basis and, and go on their way and then go back to isolating and quarantining. And, you know, it's a, it's a really serious situation. Uh, all of this happening here in Vancouver at the tail end of the last two weeks of March were spring break for school kids. And then you had the Easter long weekend. And so you've just had this period, the last sort of two to two and a half weeks where, you know, I think more people than they probably should have, have been gathering, going to local ski hills or just, you know, doing some things that maybe uh, they shouldn't have been doing, but it's human nature to, you know, the weather's starting to turn nice and and people want to get out and, and do things and, uh, you just, you know, we're being asked to, again, sort of double down on, on vigilance and somehow, some way, and I'm not pointing fingers uh, because, yes, they're hockey players, but at the same time, they're members of society at large, and we're just seeing the spread of this virus here and now the variants as well, and it is running rampant uh, in the city of Vancouver and through the province of British Columbia, really into a third wave. So, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, we see these guys as hockey players, but they're human beings, and the toll that it's taking on the players, their families, uh, and we just don't know the long-term implications. And so while everybody wants to see hockey again, uh, it's health above all else. First and foremost, you've got to get these guys healthy. And even if you do get them healthy and they, you know, pass COVID tests repeatedly, 
we don't know what the, the longer term implications are for elite level athletes that if they do get up and running again and play this, you know, the remainder of their season, they've got 19 games to go. Uh, what kind of team can they assemble? Who is going to be available to them? Who is going to feel the effects of this longer than others? So uh, again, there's way more questions than answers right now, but suffice to say, not a good situation here in Vancouver. I think the league doesn't want them to stop and shut down. It is a tough season. Uh, it's been bad with even family members and everything going on. <sighs> when could we even possibly or remotely expect them back? Is it two weeks, three weeks longer? Yeah, I mean, look, they had the, the initial game against Calgary, the home game on the 31st of March, that was postponed. Mm -hmm. Then the Canucks were supposed to go out on the road for seven in a row. They had a seven-game road trip that was going to take them uh, Edmonton, and then to Winnipeg for a pair, to Calgary for two, and then to finish up back in Edmonton for two more. So it was a seven-game road trip uh, all in Western Canada. But, you know, they haven't officially postponed all of those games yet. It's really an ongoing situation. Uh, but I don't see any way that they would play any of the road games. So, uh, you know, I, I think the soonest you're looking is sort of the middle of this month. They had uh, a four game homestand, Toronto and Ottawa were both supposed to be coming through Vancouver uh, to face the Vancouver Canucks. I'm with you. I, I think the league at all costs will, uh, again, keeping safety in mind, safety of the players, but for the competitive balance, like I don't know how you just shut one team down and ask the others to carry on. Uh, where things like draft standings and placement at the end of the year, uh, you know, they matter, they do. And so, um, you know, through all of this, even though the Canucks haven't played now in two weeks, they've still played two games more than the Montreal Canadiens. Mm -hmm. And I don't hear anybody crying about how are the Canadians going to finish their season. Uh, they're going to play out the games as they're scheduled. It's going to take some work. But, you know, the one thing that uh, the league has going for it is in these COVID times, all of the buildings are wide open every night. There aren't concerts that you're dealing with or ice shows or trade shows or anything else. So uh, that simplifies a difficult matter a little bit at the very least. And I, I do think uh, whether it is getting guys healthy and back up and running and, and get the green light to play, whether it's the taxi squad guys that have been healthy through this, whether it's some injured guys that might be able to get healthy uh, because of this delay and with a few call-ups from Utica, the Canucks farm team, you know, it might be a patchwork, but I do think that they will play their game. Will they play the remaining 19? I don't have the answer to that. I do think they will resume their season. We're going to touch base on that in a second and allow me to interject. I haven't said this yet. You can listen to Jeff talk all Canucks on the VanCast pod for the athletic. And you can reach him on Twitter at Patterson, Jeff. Our like, it's a, Supposed to be a 56 game season. Could we see then maybe a possibility of a shortened season for Connect, uh, Vancouver? Could we see something like, and maybe I'm forward thinking than maybe some other people, but other teams we know those teams are going to make the playoffs. We're expecting Toronto, we're expecting uh, Edmonton, and those teams making the playoffs. And maybe you plan the schedule and leave. The games versus the Sens and maybe the Flames till the end and maybe not play them. Is that possible? Do we leave that maybe off the table? Uh, it is. Let me take it one step further. And this is something I've floated. I, I don't think that this would actually happen. Mm -hmm. But again, in these crazy COVID times, yeah. if ever there was a year where something like this could happen, imagine sort of a parallel universe where the you know, 16 teams qualify for the Stanley Cup playoffs, they get going. Meanwhile, you do what you just mentioned. You leave the games against the Flames and the Senators. And it looked, the Flames were in a free fall. It looks like they basically have played their way out of playoff contention now. So I think the four teams that were going to qualify for the playoffs, regardless, are going to be those four teams. How about you start the playoffs and on a parallel track, you could have the Flames and the Canucks and the Senators play out their remaining games so that they get to 56. I, I don't know how much buy-in you'd get from the players who would be asked to play games while other teams are competing for the Stanley Cup, but you've got this endless sort of runway. There, again, empty buildings. 
I, I think theoretically something like that could happen. The players are contracted to play the games wherever they're scheduled. I, I just don't know how much appetite some of these guys would have knowing that these games really are, are for nothing more than seeding for the playoff lottery. But I, I do think that something like that is possible. But to your point, at the very least, rejig the schedule so that the games against the Flames and the Senators are towards the back end. The Canucks still have four left with both of those teams. And if they're not required or they can't play those games, you know, then maybe you go on points percentage. But you, you do have a playoff tournament that is going to go ahead and you need to see those teams that qualify for the postseason. And other than Montreal, the Canucks have games left against everybody. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just the Canucks that we're talking about because their schedule impacts uh, some of these teams that are going to be taking part in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Yep, there's a lot of money there to be had for the league and those associations that they deal with for those games. Of course, the Canucks obviously will probably be standing pat, and we hope that they get healthy for the team, their family members, and the city. You can find them on Twitter, at Patterson Jeff. Thank you for stopping by, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Let's gear up for this special trade deadline episode. First up, the New Jersey Devils will go to Jersey and talk to Matt Lachlan. He's the New Jersey Devils radio play-by-play -play man. You can find him on Twitter, at Matt Lock. That's L-O-U-G. Welcome back to the show, Matt. Hey, Peter. Thanks very much for inviting me. Yes, it's an exciting time around the National Hockey League. Unfortunately, from a devil standpoint, when you're a seller, it's not as enjoyable, but we know there will be news shortly involving the team. There sure will be. Uh, the main name I'm hearing, obviously, with him being sat out is Kyle Palmieri. Uh, is he 200% gone? And where could he go? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. He's gone. Uh, Tom Fitzgerald circled back with Kyle's representatives over the weekend just to see if they could come to any kind of an agreement, narrow the gap, whatever. Uh, there was no momentum. Uh, whatever the answer was, it wasn't to Tom's satisfaction. And so to protect an asset, he has decided that Kyle won't play the rest of the way for the New Jersey Devils. By the way, we found out just this morning that the Buffalo Sabres are employing the same tactic as it comes to Taylor Hall, and it makes sense. You've got an asset. You don't want to risk anything. And I talk about what happened to Brendan Gallagher last night. Suddenly a player breaks a finger and he's out. No team is interested in him. So it's, uh, it's smart strategy, that's for sure. So, yes, he is gone. Now, where? Well, I mean, it depends on who else shakes out of the market and, and whether or not uh, a GM views, say, Taylor Hall as more of an answer than Kyle. I think there's also uh, a question of conversations that will take place if a team has spoken with Kyle's representatives, with permission, of course, to say, listen, would you be willing to stay here and hear the parameters of a deal? Well, then that would make that GM want to give up more assets. So we'll see. I think all the cast of characters that have been mentioned are in play. You know, someone mentioned to me Colorado the other day, and I'm like, really? What do they need more? <laughs> like, not that he couldn't help. He's got experience and grit, but my goodness, they're hitting on all cylinders. I think Boston's an obvious uh, area where he could wind up. I think the Islanders are possible, Philadelphia, and even Minnesota. I think Minnesota would be a possibility as well as, uh, you know, they've hit their stride in the last three weeks or so. And to add a player like that certainly would help bolster their lineup. Is there another name out there, like a big name, like a Travis Zajac available? Well, Tom Fitzgerald will take calls on anybody. And I would not be surprised, particularly the way Travis has played this year and particularly lately. Honestly, coming out of the COVID pause, he had lost a step or two, but I think that was true of a lot of players. However, he's regained it. He, speed was never an asset. He couldn't afford to lose much of it, but uh, it was noticeable. However, it's back, and he, it's certainly more than good enough for him to contribute. And now he's scoring a little bit. I think he would revisit it if asked by the team. My guess is the team has already approached him a little bit about it if we get a call. Last year, he said no. Different circumstances. He had 
the end of last year plus another year on his contract. And I just don't think he wanted to move around. I didn't think he wanted to uproot his family. I think it would take a special circumstance. I don't know that he wants to leave his family and go out west, for instance. Not to say that he wouldn't want to be reunited in Minnesota, say, with his old buddy, Zach Parisi. But I think family is awfully important to him. That does not mean that Philadelphia or the Islanders wouldn't be a destination that would open up his eyes. Philadelphia fighting to get in. The Islanders certainly have a position, a position secured. Andy Green, his good friend from the Devils, went there last year was able to make the commute, has maintained his home in New Jersey, making the commute. And so Travis certainly has an idea of what that's like. So that that would not surprise me if Lou Lamorello came a calling for a former devil. Both Palmieri and Zajac have been a part of the Zog organization for a very, very long time. Uh, Palmieri, six years, Zajac seems like forever. What kind of impact would that do to the organization if one or both leave? Yeah, well, the the organization is clearly moving on. And mm-hmm. if Tom Fitzgerald felt that Kyle, and we'll get to Travis in a second, uh, was going to be an important part of the organization, uh, then they would get a deal done. And it's not that he doesn't think Kyle would be important. It's just how long will he be important? I don't know what all these young players will do ultimately. The Devils have stockpiled a lot of picks and prospects over the last few years, and they're starting to bubble to the surface. And so you want to clear a path for them, both in the lineup and financially, quite frankly, with a flat cap. So I think with Kyle, it's really more what he and his representatives want in terms of a longer term deal. And Tom Fitzgerald saying, look, not five years, not six years, maybe three. And Kyle's people saying, no, we think we can get that on the open market. So the impact will be a leader leaving the locker room and a guy that you could have depended on in past years for 25 goals. This year mm-hmm. has been a difficult year for Kyle. It's hard to judge with all the COVID stuff and the compressed schedule, but he's not scored at that rate. He's put home a couple in recent games, but not at the rate you would expect. So the Devils will miss him, yes, but he only has eight goals. So somebody else will step up and take that. For Travis, it's a little different because he plays center. So from a leadership standpoint and showing how to do it, he has the same traits that Kyle does, more rooted with the Devils, although Kyle certainly is a Jersey guy uh, and has done a lot to integrate himself into the community. But Travis is a drafted, trained and uh, raised, if you will, New Jersey Devil, mm-hmm. and has played over a thousand games. All those things. So I, I think he has a little bit more of an importance from an organization standpoint, historical standpoint. And he plays the center position, and he can still play it. And so it's a little different there. Would it hurt the team? Yes, but it's similar to to Kyle. I mean, Travis has seven goals. He scored two the other day. Uh, there are other centers who are knocking on the door. That being said, if something were to happen, if both were to go and not sign with the teams they go with, I think the Devils would revisit bringing them back. Maybe more likely Travis just because of his connection with the team and his position. Uh, the league never gets caught for any kind of tampering in the future. So it's interesting <laughs> to think that. Uh, the other name I was maybe thinking of is Dmitry Kulikov. Could he be available, and what kind of impact would he be for a team? Sure. Well, and and Ryan Murray has played well as of late, too, a veteran guy who is an unrestricted free agent, as is Kulikov, and I think Tom will take calls on those guys. Uh, Will they be significant, either one of them, upgrades to a team? Mm -hmm. Uh, Probably not. Uh, Kulikov has really played top pairing minutes with P.K. Subban, and he's been good. He, he doesn't contribute offensively, but he would be that veteran presence. You know, he's just turned 30. I guess he's 30. Yeah, he's just 30. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, a team could certainly use him, even if they think he's not part of their future. Would he fit in, say, in a Florida with Ekblad? He's not going to replace Ekblad, but he gives some depth there. So, yes, I think there are teams that would like him. The number is low, uh, even – for the remaining six weeks, a team could squeeze him under the cap quite easily. And the same would be true of Ryan Murray. It would just give a team a veteran presence. From a devil standpoint, temporarily, yes, they could have Will Butcher come back into the lineup or Connor Carrick. Matt Tennyson has been up and down between the AHL and the taxi squad, did play earlier in the year. 
So all those would be options for the team to use. The question that becomes moving forward next year and beyond the D core that they have down in the farm is very young. Either way, there are decisions to be made over the summer in terms of acquiring some talent, whether it's a re-signing Kulikov or Murray if they're not traded. So uh, this will be a summer of defense from a devil standpoint for sure. But I do think that if Fitzgerald looks at it and says, you're giving me a reasonable asset, uh, I don't think a seventh round pick is necessarily a reasonable asset, but that's how the devils have been building picks, adding prospects and development. So the more you get, the better your shot at hitting a home run with a pick. So uh, anybody is possible to move on. Hey, I'd love to see Carrick back in the lineup up there and maybe you can uh, reach out to him and he can join my podcast. (laughs) <laughs> you know, Connor is a podcast guy, right? I mean, he is uh, taking a deep dive into it and, and has done a lot of work on his own. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, like I, I was kind of surprised on, on Connor. I know we're diverging a little bit mm-hmm. here, but I thought he had a pretty good camp and I thought he'd see more action than he did. But yeah. he has spent most of his time down in the American Hockey League. Yeah, that's true. All right. You can find him on Twitter at MacLock. Matt, thank you for stopping in. Hey, Peter, thank you for inviting me again. Uh, the Devils will be active. How active? We'll find out, but we'll, we'll certainly be following along, and uh, it's, it's an interesting time indeed. Let's go out west. Next up, the Anaheim Ducks. We've got Jason Hernandez. He's the host of Locked on Ducks. You can find him on Twitter, at StimpyJD. How you doing, Jason? I'm doing well. How are you doing today? It's a struggle. It's always a struggle. I think we all have our things. We're busy. Sports is busy, even though it's a pandemic. My computer's breaking down, so I'm dealing with that. I don't know what happened there. I guess I would put uh, the portable hard drive. You know when it always tells you to it to eject and eject cleanly, and I'm like, oh, it's telling me not to. So I reboot and everything. It's still like, all right, okay, so I'll just keep the hard drive. I'll close the computer nicely, and I'll take it downstairs. No. The next day I show up, I'm doing my, you know, my sports journalism program and I wake up in the morning and my screen is fractured because of oh, a no. little dent from a little portable hard drive delicately, delicately taken downstairs. Oh, that really sucks. I mean, I, I've had that happen to me maybe a few years ago, kind of the same thing with my old computer where just a little itty bitty scratch or a little itty bitty crack can turn into something bigger. It sucks. I feel you there. So I've, I've been there. Yeah, thank you for that. And so, and as far as all the sports, I mean, there's all kinds of sports going on here. Soccer's happening. The Angels are playing. They're back. So mm-hmm. baseball's back. Basketball's in full swing. But hey, just across the freeway, across the 57, the LA Angels are playing, and Mike Trout is on a tear. They've got some big names out there, right? Yeah. And who's the other big name everybody's talking about? Shohei Otani. Wow. So I, I, I well, before we get into trade deadline talk, then Otani, I heard on fantasy teams, and because he's playing in the American League, right? You can yeah. technically have him as a player and separately as a pitcher. Is that correct? That is correct. So because of that, you have to select him as a pitcher on days where he pitches because he will not do both mm. because American League. So. Four times out of five, you will have him as a position player as opposed to the one day where he pitches. But I found this stat interesting where he had the fastest pitch among starting starting pitchers at 101 miles per hour and one of the fastest exit velos at 115 mm. among starting players. So I thought that was kind of cool to see. But that's not why we're here today, are we? That is not. We are not talking about the modern day Babe Ruth. Um Wait, it was, Babe was a pitcher, right? Yeah, Babe was a yeah. pitcher with the Red Sox. That's right, he was. Uh, but he could sure hit those home runs. Um, so let's go with the Ducks. I keep hearing, everybody keeps hearing, Ricard Raquel's name is on there. But he has a year left on that contract. So why is he specifically rumored to go? Well, I mean, he was more rumored to go as of last week. Obviously, right now, he's been dealing with some injury issues. So right now, those have been tempered more recently. But they look at Ricard Raquel as being a very solid asset for the team because he is a former All-Star, one. Two, he's a very flexible player. He can play, you know, second line, third line, wherever a team needs him. 
And the reason teams are looking at him, that is a very good contract that teams will want to pick up. It is not a super long one. One, it's not super expensive, too. Relatively speaking, his contract is kind of a value because he's making under $4 million per season and his contract expires at the end of 21-22. Then he becomes a UFA. So essentially, it's looking like a one-year rental. Not a rental, but a one-year and plus kind of deal. He's been struggling, though, this season. Only six goals. He's had those great years in the past of 30-goal seasons. Is he still capable remotely of scoring those 36, uh, 30 goals seasons again? Well, I mean, the reason he struggled this year is he's he's had injuries this season. He's mm-hmm. been really banged up. He's missed the last couple of games, which is why those talks have tempered a little bit recently is he's been out the last couple of games. And just dealing with some bangs and bruises from from the get-go pretty much. So I know teams are starting to become a little bit wary of that. And he's got seven goals for 22 points this season, which is not as good as previous seasons. Certainly not as good as his 18 season where he had 69 points in 77 games. Right now he's averaging about 0.6 points per game. Mm -hmm. That has gone down. Uh, The other thing to consider is the Ducks as a whole. They're not really producing much offense. So maybe it's also a residue of how the team is doing as a whole offensively. So this can't just be put on one player. You have to look at the whole package, look at everyone around him. I mean, yeah, he's had some good opportunities. His expected goals this season is still quite good. He's had some unlucky breaks. According to just uh, statistics, he should have a few more goals this season, but he's hit a few posts. He's had some really bad breaks. So that's part of it. And I've heard a ton of rumors on where Raquel could go. Um, I'm hearing Boston possibly, somewhere in Canada is a possibility. There's so many rumors out there for where he could go that it makes my head spin a little bit. Uh, So Raquel has been a part of the organization for at least nine years now. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's still the core there. Gibson, Fowler, they've been there for a long time. But the other one obviously is... Ryan gets laugh. Is it possible that the amazing gets laugh could be moved at this deadline? The only way he gets moved is if he does request a trade. Um, and that's if he wants to be traded to a contender. And there's a lot of places that he could go, but only if it's a contender. If it is not a contending team, he will not go at all. And keep in mind, this would be a rental. His contract expires at the end of the season. So that would absolutely be a rental. And the Ducks would have to eat up some of the salary for the rest of the season. Mm. Right now, he's making eight and a quarter million, but he's a UFA after this season. So you've got to expect if the Ducks move him, they're going to be eating some of that salary. And in fact, I can almost guarantee that the Ducks would eat up at least, at the very least, a quarter of his salary, maybe up to half. But if you're the Ducks, you have to look at getting some draft picks as well, maybe some high draft picks, uh, some places that he could go. I've heard a lot of rumors that Colorado is a possibility for Getzloff to go because Colorado is right now on the brink of an amazing run of games. They've had uh, 15 unbeaten, completely unbeaten. They've been 13-0-2 in their last 15 games. Colorado has been on a tear. They were my early pick to win it all. And he could really fit in with some of those uh, top two or top three lines in Colorado. And frankly, what Colorado should look for is maybe not so much Ryan Getzloff. But if I'm Colorado, I'm more concerned about the goaltending. Because, you know, you have Pavel Francis, who's been hurt. You have Grubauer, who was hurt earlier. So I think the Avs, while they are possibly looking at Getzloff, I think they're more looking or a goaltender to shore that up because you cannot have Hunter Miska as a backup goaltender. Hmm. So somewhere else that Getzloff could possibly go is Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh would also be a good pick. Uh, These two teams are familiar with each other as far as trading goes. You had the Derek Grant trade a couple years ago. You had the Sprong trade. They've dealt with each other multiple times that I would not be surprised if we see another Pittsburgh Anaheim trade coming up in next week's trade deadline. Maybe there is something 
there. I'm glad you brought up the Avs. They are look dominant, and phew, they had Getzlaff. I, I, they're just w- way too much over the top. Then, oh my goodness, uh, you if can they add Getzlaff. They would be unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> they sure would be. You can find him on Twitter at StimpyJD. Jason, thank you for stopping by. Thanks a lot. Anytime. Let's stay out on the West and go to La La Land. We got my pal Dennis Bernstein. He's on the hot stove on Sirius XM, Saturdays, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And you can find him on Kings of the Podcast, Covering the Kings. You can find him on Twitter, at Dennis TFP. Dennis, how are the Kings in L.A. doing? Peter, it's great to talk to you again. Um, Well, based on the last two weeks, specifically the games against San Jose and Arizona, they are on the outside looking in. And the prospects for the postseason are not good. So I would expect if they do anything here at the deadline, it will not be adding. It more than likely might be selling a couple of pieces. Yeah, it's it's a seller episode next week. We're going to do the the buyers episode, yeah. all the big guys that moved, and we're going to talk all about them. So let's talk about one name that everybody's talking about, and that's Alex Ayafalo. Big name. Everybody's talking about him. Where do you think he could go? Well, he could go to your home city of Toronto. He'd mm-hmm. be a nice fit on the left side. I think he's he's certainly a better option than Alex Galchenyuk um, on the second line left wing. He's uh, uh, you know a sturdy guy that plays uh, uh, with Andre Kopitar on the top line. Um, not a big time goal scorer, but a big time digger. A smart player um, can play both ways. It would help the power play as well. Moving to probably a second unit power play guy. If, not that Toronto needs that. I think that might be an option. Uh, another option, teams that need left wings. You look at Boston, they could certainly use help on the wing. And as a matter of fact, John Ferguson, their executive VP of um, player personnel and for Boston, was in Staples Center um, over the weekend scouting. Might have been scouting some Sharks players, but certainly I'm sure he was taking a look at um, at Alex Alifalo as well. Another team that needs help on, uh, on the left side would be a team like the Islanders. Now, Alex Alfalo is not a replacement for Andrews Lee. He's not that type of player. He's not a physical player, but um, he would be a nice addition because on the left side, your top two guys right now, I mean, Komarov's on the top line right now, but he's got four assists all season. Uh, Alva Wallstrom and um, Anthony Bovillier, uh, while they're, uh, they're good quality kids, they're not a, a more substantial uh, veteran like Alex Alfalo is. Now, he could stay in Los Angeles, Peter, because he is an unrestricted free agent. They are trying to sign him. But I think the situation with Alex is not unlike uh, Zach Hyman, where he just might be pricing himself out of Los Angeles with his performance this year. So when they're talking about Alfalo, and he's kind of like in his prime of his career, mm-hmm. and we're transitioning to the young guys – I guess we don't see them moving any about anybody from that older core. Uh, no, the top. Look, I, I know that the Islanders did due diligence on Dustin Brown, mm-hmm. and he would be more in the mold of Anders Lee, like a productive guy in the power play, physical presence around the net, a definite leader. But I think what's happening with the Islanders is they're probably going to go look at Columbus and and a guy like Nick Foligno. Now, he certainly fills the mold of a, a Barry Trotz team. He again, he will bring leadership, toughness around the net. Um, so I think that's the option. But yeah, Kobitar, Dowdy, D- Jeff Carter's had a tough season. So I don't think he's interested in Jonathan Quick. Uh, I just think there are better goaltending options, maybe like uh, a James Reimer in Columbus or maybe uh, Jonas Corposalo in, in, uh, in Columbus um, as opposed to Jonathan Quick. So I, I think the big moves, if they are going to make big moves, Pete. I think it's going to be in the offseason. I think they've got to make a, a, a couple of definitively big moves to close the gap between themselves and Vegas. Now, remember, we're going back to the old divisions next season. So there won't be a Colorado Avalanche. There won't be a Minnesota Wild. And coming in will be Edmonton and Calgary, two teams that, if, frankly, if I'm the front office in L.A., I wouldn't be scared of. So I think neck, in the off season would be the big moves. I just don't see it. The other option would be a guy like uh, Andreas Antonisiu, who's really um, had a redemption season. He's not a big-time scorer, but – Remember last season, I think he was a minus 45 or something like that. He's come in. Um, he's willing to commit to the de- defensive side of the puck. He'll give you touch on the bottom six. So if you're looking for a third-line left winger, um, that could be an option for some teams. So I think the two guys that primarily would be in play from Los Angeles, and not sexy names, Pete, uh, but it would be Alex Ayafalo and Andreas Anthony Sioux. 
touching base back on Ayafalo, he yeah. is having the best numbers of his career. If you had the full season, it would be a over 20 goal season, 50 points. It is time to sell high on him, right? That's his time is now. Yeah, I got to think that he's going to get, he would get at this point, hopefully if you're the Kings, a second round pick um, and a prospect for him because he, he's been that defensive player. Now, the question is, is it a halo effect? Is he getting those points because he's playing with an all-war player in Andre Kopitar and a pretty good score in Dustin Brown? So that's the question. So you have to have the right fit because he is not that, although you mentioned he's a 50-point guy, um, he's not a lights-out goal scorer, right? He gets his, his goals in the dirty in the dirty areas. He doesn't have a big-time shot. He's not, you know, an explosive skater as well. He just fits really well with Kopitar and Brown. So I think the acquiring team has to make sure they're a com- complementary players on his line that maximize his production. You can find him on Twitter at Dennis TFP. Thanks for dropping in, Dennis. Always a pleasure, PB. Thanks for the time. And of course, we can't leave out the Sharks on the West Coast. Joining me to talk San Jose players and who could be on the move is Shang Peng. He covers the Sharks at San Jose Hockey Now. You can also find them on their Facebook page. And you can find Shang on Twitter at Shang, S-H-E-N-G underscore Peng, P-E-N-G. Shang, how are you doing? Uh, very good, man. How's it going, Peter? Oh, it's, it's you know, trade deadline talk. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's busy for what it is, right? It's a different. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, you know, with that week quarantine and, you know, who has money, who doesn't have money available, yeah, definitely. Many are talking about Sorensen. He's been struggling this year. He only mm-hmm. has the one goal. Why would a team want him? On their playoff roster, uh, yeah, he's also also struggled last year too. So I think that's, that's worth <laughs> pointing out. Uh, but uh, Marcus uh, is a very good penalty killer. Uh, he's been a top choice uh, PKer for the Sharks for a couple of years uh, running, uh, and also too, he does have some scoring track record too. In 2018-19, he scored 17 goals. Of course, he did it uh, next to uh, Joe Thornton, and he doesn't have that benefit to San Jose. So I think uh, with a guy like Sorensen, um, you know, you're if you're with the Sharks, you're not obviously going to get a lot. Uh, if you're a team that's looking to get him, he's probably uh, you know one of those kind of taxi squad depth guys in case of injury, you know, in case block uh, glass uh, breaks kind of guy. Some teams like the Leafs are and others are intrigued about acquiring goaltending depth. Both net miners for the Sharks have had a rough go this year. Martin Jones, Devin Dubnik. Dubnik could be on the move. How could he even remotely help a contending team? Well, first, uh, you know, uh, be careful with the uh, – please put respect in the name of Martin Jones. Martin Jones' save percentage is over uh, 90% uh, finally. So, mm. <laughs> uh, Jones is a 7-1 and I think 7-1-1 and one in his last nine with a save percentage of uh, 94%. Uh, so, I just wanted to throw that out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, uh, in regards to Dumnik specifically, what value does he have? Uh, well, uh, he's a veteran. Uh, he's obviously a guy who has started a lot of games in his uh, career, uh, former, former uh, Vezina finalist, and not saying that he is that guy anymore, uh, but he has that kind of uh, in his back pocket. And so uh, he can do way worse for either a backup or, uh, or a third goalie. I think another plus for uh, Dubnik, too, is uh, Dubnik is a very, uh, at least in my experience and from what we've seen, uh, just uh, what we heard over the years, very easygoing guy. So he's a guy that, is I think well suited for a backup role. You know, he's not going to come in and you know kind of uh, carp because oh, you know, I was a Vezina finalist in like 2015. You know, I I should get a shot at the number one. So I think that's that's a big plus for him. Also, too, his contract isn't too bad. Um, it's uh, at 2.17 now. Minnesota took half of it. Uh, retained half when he traded him to San Jose. So uh, San Jose could even retain more. Re- re- San Jose can retain from that 2.17. And so I think these are a couple of things that make Dubnik attractive as a 2-3 goalie. Dubnik's cap hit will be very flexible for some of those contending teams. Patrick Marlowe is again a UFA this summer. He is, and we'll talk about this in the next couple of weeks, very 
is there a rumor? I do, I want to go this before maybe thinking about moving him or anything. But mm-hmm. it, what could be the possibility of nicknaming Marlowe the next Mr. Hockey? I don't know what you would do with a guy who's still playing and he's on pace this season to surpass Gordie Howe's record of most games played by an NHL player. I have to say that is uh, sacrilegious, uh, Peter. I'm not even Canadian myself, and I am offended by that suggestion. <laughs> uh, let's uh, just uh, give uh, Patty, if you want to call him Patty Hockey, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, and he likes Patty uh, himself. So, uh, yeah, so I think I think we'll stick with that. Uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, let's uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let, let, let's respect the late great uh, veteran there in uh, Glory Hell. <laughs> so in terms of respecting him, all right, we could have called him Patty Hockey. The chances of him leaving San Jose, I don't know. I think they're slim to nil. What do you think are the chances? Of course, he is going for that record, and I think he would get more games in if he stays with San Jose, right? Well, the truth of the matter is that it was uh, Marlo himself that started the, this uh, uh, this cycle of the trade mill. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, we assumed, uh, and we meeting the, the media, um, that when San Jose signed them, it was pretty much, well, here's a guy that recognizes that the Sharks are not a top contender, and he wants to break his record, and he wants to finish out his career at home in San Jose. All, you know, that's, you know, perfectly admirable goals. Uh, you know, he deserves to kind of call where he wants to go, right? Uh, so about uh, three weeks ago, you know, he had this typical uh, pregame presser, uh, and actually, it was a question I, I asked him. Uh, I asked him if uh, he had sort of a uh, what what record had more meaning to him uh, because he's actually working on two uh, big records now. He's working on on the uh, all time games played record, Gordy's record, of course, right? But he's also working on the consecutive games played record. Uh, that's a uh, Doug Jarvis's uh, record. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, he is uh, Marlo is a little bit behind uh, Yando on that record. Uh, Yando has a little bit of a lead on him, but both of them are. I think Marlowe is like 890-something on that record. Uh, Yando is 900-plus, a little bit over 900. And that record is stands at 964 games, consecutive games played by Doug Jarvis. Uh, so both are very impressive records. So I just sort of asked him, this is kind of a throwaway question, to be honest. I just sort of asked him which one uh, might have a little more significance uh, to him. And he uh, answered, uh, actually, the most important goal for me is to win the Stanley Cup. Now, when he said that, the Sharks at that point uh, were not even close to the playoff race. I believe they were eight points out of the playoffs. And uh, there were already a lot of uh, rumors picking up around guys like uh, Dubnik, Sorensen, uh, Matt Nieto, who we'll get to, right, uh, UFAs to be. And none of the uh, rumor mill was attached to Marlow because we, again, uh, just assumed when he re-signed with San Jose that, you know, he, he sort of knew that what he was getting himself into with, with the Sharks. And so once he said that, it sort of made us wonder, well, is he open to a trade? And so uh, other reporters dug into that. And indeed, he confirmed that uh, he would always consider uh, a trade if it was brought to him. And so that is, uh, you know, that's straight. This is all straight from Marlo himself. This is not, uh, this is not anybody's uh, conjecture. Uh, so what is my conjecture is that when he signed with San Jose, I think uh, that you know, he's 41. Of course, he wants to win his Stanley Cup naturally. And so I think there's a hope that San Jose could bounce back quickly from last season's disappointing year and that the Sharks would be in a good cloud position and that he would be in a, you know, uh, Sharks would, maybe wouldn't be a Vegas caliber contender, but they would be in it and they'll be in the playoffs and he could still kind of, uh, he can, you know, kind of uh, satisfy uh, many kind of needs, you know, be at home, break the record. Uh, and, you know, be on a playoff team. And obviously that hasn't exactly worked out for San Jose, though, though, uh, though uh, they've been on a little bit of a run lately. Uh, they played quite well recently, so they're kind of knocking on the door at that fourth and final playoff spot. But anyway, so I, I think uh, my read on it is that uh, Marlo controls where he wants to go. If he wants to go, uh, actually Bob Bugner has said as much. Uh, but basically, uh, if a team wants Marlo on their team, and he is, I guess, kind of in the same place as a Sorensen, in my opinion, where uh, he can still do good things for you. He's still uh, he's still a playable player. He's not quite fallen into a place where, where he shouldn't be playing. <laughs> Excuse me, but 
he also is scratchable too. That's just this is just my frank opinion of, of, of Marlowe's game this year. He isn't as good as he was last year uh, when he netted the Sharks a third round draft pick from the Penguins. If the Sharks get anything for him, it won't be as much as a third round pick for sure. Um, but anyway, so I think it depends on the team that approaches the Sharks and if the team is deemed by Patrick Marlowe to be uh, kind of a contending team. You know, if a fringe playoff team, like, say, I don't know, I'm just throwing out a, a team like the Coyotes approach the Sharks, right? You know, what would the, be the reason for Patrick to go from uh, the Sharks to the Coyotes? You know, he's not going to win the, the Stanley Cup with the Coyotes. At least he's not likely to. Um, so, yeah. So, I think I think uh, if a team is interested in Marlowe, uh, I think Wilson would take whatever he can get and bring it to, to Marlowe if he wants to go there. Before we go, you mentioned him, Matt Nieto. Just give me a percentage. What are the chances Nieto leaves? I would have said it was 100% uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Nieto uh, has uh, done a really great job on a penalty kill, but also uh, he uh, has been has filled in nicely in the top six when necessary. Not to say that he's a top six player, but uh, he uh, um, he can do some of those little things where he can play up and down the lineup. You know, He is not a scratchable player. He's a guy that should be in your lineup every night. He is a playoff championship, in my opinion, caliber fourth line player. That's not a knock on him. He's a very, very good, very good, useful player. But he suffered from a lower body injury uh, three weeks ago, and the timeline keeps uh, getting pushed back on him. At uh, first, we thought he'd be back, uh, you know, day to day, and now it's uh, been three weeks and running. We talked to Bob Bugner today. Bugner says that he may not, he may not be ready in a week or two. So I could see him, uh, you know, teams losing interest because of that. Um, so yeah, so that's me. And one thing I should mention since we are at the end too, uh, something else that is very valuable to the Sharks have at the deadline is their cap space. And uh, Pierre LeBron had a story about that about a week ago, and I had a story about that today. Uh, basically, the Sharks have a lot of cap space available uh, for them to be kind of the middleman in a three-way trade. And as rare as three-way trades are, we saw that last year at trade deadline when uh, Toronto took on Robin Leonard and took on half of his cap hit from Chicago before rerouting him to Vegas. And so San Jose is very much in play for that. You know, could the Sharks be the middleman in, say, a Taylor Hall trade? That seems uh, very, very possible. You can find him on Twitter at Shang underscore Peng. Thanks for stopping by, Shang. Absolutely, buddy. Anytime. Back out east we go. Buffalo Sabres, of course. Tough season they've been going with. Already sellers at the deadline, before the deadline. Eric Stahl has gone. We have now Joe Yerden. He's back on the show. He's been with NBC Sports, NHL.com, of course, and most recently, recently with The Athletic. Where can people find you now, Joe? You can find me occasionally covering uh, covering the games in Buffalo for the Associated Press. Also, you can find me at Die by the Blade on the SB Nation network of blogs. Yes, join in our pals over there. Uh, say hi to Chad for me. Yeah, I, I will. I certainly will. Chad's a good guy. <laughs> All right. You can also reach him on Twitter, at Joe Yearden. Wow. So are you, I know we mentioned and you came on to preview the season for the Sabres and I probably preached too much about the expectations, but are you now kind of slightly more excited about what the team could maybe possibly get for Taylor Hall? You know, I, I think this season has been such a wear down that, mm. and he's had such a, a poor, you know, just counting stat season that I'm not exactly juiced up about that. Like, mm. I, I think I think there's a goal in mind that if they can get a first first round pick for him, then I think that then they'll be happy with it. But on the other hand, his what he's done this season isn't first round pick worthy. Mm. So I think it's 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 a battle between what they want to get and what they feel they should get versus what teams are going to offer for him. And, and you know, I keep in mind what teams were offering him contract wise before the year where you know the sabers gave him 8 million and like that was uh, you know 3 2 or 3 million more than what any other team was offering for him and you know he didn't sign the first day of free agency either so um that that fact on top of the you know the the lack of production this year and listen buffalo is a special circumstance given how badly they've been just all around this season um but you know i, I look at how he's played even since Ralph Kruger has been fired and there's certainly 
it, it looks, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to question his effort, but he just does not look the same mm. uh, since Ralph's been fired. Like the, the engagement isn't quite there. And I don't know if that's just a matter of him being like, well, whatever, I'm leaving. So <laughs> I can't, I can't really go, you know, I can't really go all out here and expect, you know, things to change. Like this team's not going to play off. So, you know, I'm going to get traded. So like, let's, let's ease off on the gas pedal a little bit, but um, you know, I, 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 I see how the way the, the way the seasons progressed for him. And I just, I could just see Kevin Adams just going bonkers in the room, just going like, man, I, I got to trade this guy as soon as possible before the value comes down where it's like, well, the best offer I've got now is, you know, is a C level prospect and a third round pick like mm. that, that kind of return isn't going to cut it. And the fans will, fans are already sore about the team and literally everything that's blue and gold right now. So if he doesn't get a good return on Taylor Hall, people are going to be really upset about it. What would teams and fans of those teams expect in getting a guy like Taylor Hall? Because we've already seen what other people are saying. We don't want him. We don't want that cancer on our team. Is it all on Taylor Hall in terms of what how he's been playing? Or is it more on who he's been playing with this season and in the most recent years? Well, I'd say I'd say early on. Um, for the better part of the season, he was really snake bit the same way Jack was snake bit the same way Jeff Skinner was snake bit. Like it, it's wild to think that you'd have so many high end scorer scorer types and offensive weapons that just couldn't find a way to get the puck in the net, mm-hmm. but that's how it was. I mean, these guys were all generating chances. They were getting shots. They were getting scoring opportunities and nothing was going in. We, you know, whether it's, you know, bad luck or goalies being hot, like whatever the case, these guys just weren't getting a break. And yeah, he was juggled a little bit between the first and second line. And, you know, obviously when Jack went out, that changed things quite a bit. Um, But I mean, he was playing with Eric Stahl or he was playing with Sam Reinhardt or, you know, it was he and Stahl and Opozo for a little bit or, you know, different machinations of of how Ralph Kruger and Don Granato have kind of rolled out the lineup. It's it's obviously been different now, um, understandably so. But um, but I think from that perspective, aspect if you've got some smart teams that that dig around with some of the offensive numbers you could look at his some of those deeper offensive numbers like the expected goal numbers and and things like that and say geez taylor hall was actually really doing his job well just you know everything that could go wrong has gone wrong for buffalo and he was just a factor of that but if you want to go you know what have you done for me lately well he's done nothing lately and he hasn't been very helpful um and that's that's an issue i i think you could see but I think at that point, Kevin Adams might just point to Eric Stahl and say, well, look, the second he he was able to play for his new team, he scored an overtime winner and had a couple of points. Mm-hmm. So maybe when he this when this guy joins your team and you guys are going well, then things are going to change. But um, that can be a tough sell. Like selling hope at the deadline, that only works for teams that are selling, uh, not really for teams that are buying. Brandon Montour might be a good addition to a team looking for depth on the back end. What can he bring to a team? Well, I'd say with him, I would be encouraged as, as the opposite of Hall. Like since since Kruger's been gone, uh, you've seen a little bit more of the natural Montour ability. Uh, he, you know his his want to get up into the play. The you know his ability to rush the puck. He's been a little bit more physical. I mean, he had had a couple of shorthanded goals uh, against Philadelphia in that six to one win, where you know I think he set the NHL record for fastest two shorthanded goals by a defenseman Mm -hmm. ever you know ever in league history where it was 30 some seconds apart so you know random (laughs) out of all the darkness of the season you get you get a new record nhl record set but um i I think in his case you're you're looking at how well he did under phil housley when when they traded for him a couple years ago and how well he's done since since ralph's gone now the problem being that's you know two coaches ago with what he did under under housley and now it's you know what six seven eight games it's going to be whenever you know if he if he gets moved uh on playing for granado so you don't you don't really have a lot of that hey ignore this year and a half two years worth of work you can't really trust people are going to do that but uh, if you know there are teams out there that have been high on him before, but maybe you know, kind of pulled back interest because he looked like crap under Kruger, which I mean, hey, you, you can't really argue that he had to play on his offside constantly. He had to play, you know, out of position so much. He had to play forward a couple of times a couple of years ago. So I mean, 
you know, crap happens a lot and sometimes you got to deal with it. And Montour has been a good, good enough soldier about that, but he's played better. Um, so if you need a right-handed defenseman, and I know teams like crazy always need right-handed defensemen, but if you need a righty D who can move the puck, can play physical, can play with a little bit of offensive touch and works well. Uh, and if you've got a spot in like the, maybe I'd say the second or third pairing where you need help, he's, a, I think he's an automatic guy that you have to take a look at because it, it's a, it's a pure rental if you want it to be. I mean, he's set to be a UFA in the summer. If he goes, he goes, if he doesn't, that's fine. But you know, you don't, you're probably, you're probably not giving up the, the same package Buffalo gave up to get him in the first place where it was a fellow D prospect and a first round pick like Buffalo ain't recouping that ain't recouping that. But, uh, but I would say, you know, given that they've, they've been kind of kicking the tires on sending him out before this. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would say teams know that he's out there, but his play of late has to be encouraging. And if I'm, if I'm a team that needs a righty D, you know, Toronto always seems to need, need defense. I don't know how, I don't know how eager Buffalo would be to trade with Toronto uh, all things given, but, um, but I know there's a lot of teams that could use a, a solid right D in the depth, in a depth spot like that. Can't ask for a guy better than that, where, you know, he's just going to lay it all out. Is Linus Allmark available or how far off are the Sabres in re-signing him? Well, I think, I think Buffalo is in a spot where everybody's available. Mm. Um, I think, I think in Allmark's case, he's been, he's kind of been in that, that sort of that damning shadow of the, your team stinks and you're the goalie. So it must be your fault kind of thing. And you, you have to dig through and sort through the different goaltending stats that are available. Now, there's not a whole ton of advanced stuff that you can really check out. I mean, aside from, you know, where he's giving up goals, hot zones and things like that. But, um, but he was really good last year. Uh, but the Sabres penalty kill was God awful, like horrible, bad, terrible. And his, you know, his save percentage was the same as Carter Hutton's save percentage on, on, on the penalty kill where I think it was something like 830, 830 or 840 or something like that. It was mm-hmm. bad. I mean, we're talking, you know, bottom, bottom 10, 15 in the goalies in the, in the league, bad kind of thing. Um, so I, when I see that, when I see that kind of similarity where it's both goalies coming up with the same rate, I'm thinking that's more on the PK than it is the goalies. You know, if, if the guys in front of them aren't doing the work to try to help keep the puck away, then, the goalie's under fire, and that was definitely the case. Uh, but he's gotten those saves this year, and the PK has been better this year. Certainly, you know, certainly a little bit more lately, but they were better in general. It was hard to be worse. The only team worse than them last year was Detroit, and they were <laughs> they were the worst in the league by mm-hmm. by a long shot. So, um, but I I do wonder where Buffalo's head at as far as what they think of him. I mean, they've, they've had eyes on him forever and I don't know if they've been waiting for him to be the next Miller or to try to, you know, to try to be that, you know, that 925, 930 goaltender where I think that's an unrealistic standard at this point um, for anybody. And I don't know if it's history just playing a role in that where, you know, the last two longtime goalies here were Miller, probably a hall of famer and Hashik who is, is a hall of famer. So it's like, you know, you can't, you can't really play around with that where if guys, you know, put in a 920 season, you're like, no, it was okay, but he didn't win every game. So he stinks, you know, <laughs> like that's, that's what ends up happening here. It happened to Robin Leonard a couple, a couple of years in a row where he posted a 920 save percentage and people were just like, yeah, he's okay, I guess, but he's, he's no Miller. Like, well, nobody is like very <laughs> few goalies are. So I, I think in his case, you can, you, I'm torn on this because they don't, have anybody ready behind him like Lukanen needs he needs a full actual season of AHL mm-hmm. action like you need you need to have a better idea of what he is and what he's capable of um and I think if you trade if you trade Olmark now I think you just end up throwing Lukanen to the to the wolves in the NHL and saying like all right kid let's see what you got and then you're not getting a fair judgment of him again yeah. um but I think I think in Olmark's case, I, I do wonder, I mean, he, he, he's happy, he's happy with Buffalo, but I got to believe he would, you know, for all these guys that, that might be free agents, they, they all want to go to a better situation, but it's hard to leave a team where Jack is so good and you see how good Jack is. And you're like, well, they've already got a superstar there. 
it's going to take not much to get it to, you'd think to get it figured out. Granted, it's been a few years. Um, but I, I think in, 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 when you get, when you've been in an organization that long, you might start thinking like, I don't know, let's see what, let's see what the grass is like on the other side. And I think in all Mark's case, and with goaltending being such demand for, for so many teams that are borderline playoff or need help when they get to the playoffs, um, in that kind of situation, I think Allmark is probably one of the more desirable guys you can go after, which means the price is right. I think you move them. And at, I think at that point, you just say, you know, I, I think if you're in Buffalo's position, you're in a worse spot because the goaltending market in the off season isn't as rich as it was last year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you look ahead at what's available next year and it's not exciting and it's not, not really going to draw you out. If you're looking for somebody to be a stopgap or what have you, um, that's not enthralling. And I wouldn't be, that's like, you're thinking if you're in Buffalo spot, you're thinking ahead to next year, but you're also thinking further down the road and all marks, at the age where you can, th- where you can, you have to ask the question, is he get, is he the answer to both of these questions? I mean, if it's next year, absolutely he is. Is it down the road? He might be, he might be if he, if he's, if he's in that opportunity. And I think that's, that, that's where you're kind of torn if you're, if you're the Sabres, because yeah, you might be able to get a lot for him at this deadline, but what is it going to cost you down the road when you're not sure what your goaltending is going to be? Yeah, if I was the Sabres, I would re-up Allmark because I think it was two years ago, NHL 19, the game, I plucked away Lukanen from the Sabres, and I'm like, this guy's going to be good. He's got so much potential, and he was a bust for me. I had him. I was like, all right, I'm going to give him a good long-term contract, and he never became anything. So Sabres, Adams, Lock up Allmark uh, because it's probably the best move, at least for me, it was on the game. <laughs> hey, man, I, I did that with what fantasy ho- or like a ho- NHL hockey or hockey manager on yeah. PC. And I decided to trade Jonas Johansson away mm-hmm. to Philadelphia because I was like, I got Allmark. I'm, go- I'm good to go here. He had a great season. I traded Johansson. Johansson won the best of the next year with Philadelphia. Huh. So I may have erred a bit and but hey i got buffalo to the to the uh, eastern conference final so i didn't feel too bad about it mm. but yeah i didn't get there because of jonas i got there because of linus but yeah yeah video games they <laughs> they have they have fun ways of throwing it in our face when we when we make the wrong choice you can find him on twitter at joe yearden joe thank you for stopping by thanks peter good to talk to you again Let's finish up with a team at the beginning of the season we didn't think would be here where they are today. We have now on the show Jay Forrester. You can listen to Jay on the daily podcast for the Columbus Blue Jackets, Locked on Blue Jackets. Of course, links to all our guests and everything we mention on this show are on the episode page. This episode's episode 17, season 6, jablamsports.com is the website. You can reach Jay on Twitter at J the goalie. Jay, what kind of goaltender are you? Um, ice hockey, obviously. Uh, <laughs> so I so a funny story actually. I really wanted um to use Jake and Bake as my Twitter handle. Yeah. Uh, and for the longest time, uh, Jake Gensel of the Pittsburgh Penguins was using it. And so I couldn't. And so I was like, literally, this is just another example of why the Penguins refuse to respect me as a person. <laughs> All right. Always some battles with Ohio and Pennsylvania. Uh, let's get to a person that could be maybe traded to Pennsylvania uh, for Pittsburgh. Uh, and the name everybody is talking about, and maybe the number one on the trade bait board in a lot of boards, and that's David Savard. Sometimes I always like to say Denis Savard. I love Denis Savard. He had great spinoramas. But a pretty mobile defenseman on the blue line for the Blue Jackets. That defender, uh, David Savard, he's been in, on the team for over a decade. Uh, where could he go? What is Jim Yarmulkeklinen expecting in return for a guy like Savard? Um, I mean, I think Kekalainen could pretty much choose his price for a guy like Savard. He is the perfect kind of trade deadline pickup. I think um, he's not one of the, he's not, you know, he's not going to go out there and score 20 goals. He's not the most, 
dynamic defenseman, I guess is the is the way to say it. But you know, he plays a lot of minutes. He will block shots until the end of time. He's got, you know, a lot of those kind of quote unquote intangibles that hockey media people like to talk about. You know, he's got grit. He's a good veteran guy. Um so I think, you know, of the 30 other teams out there, I think probably, you know, close to 20 of them will want would want Savard on their team. Um I've heard uh Montreal might be interested in him. Winnipeg is the is the the loudest name I've heard. Uh they're really really in need of not even just good defense but just like something solid and stabilizing because their defense uh, much like Columbus is kind of a mess at the minute. Um I was talking to one of my colleagues at Locked On Podcast Network here, uh Armando Velez, host of Locked On Panthers. Panthers could be a potential landing spot for him. Obviously they're without Ekblad for the next 11 to 12 weeks so there's a there's a lot of places that a guy like Sabard could end up but yeah I don't see him finishing the season as a blue jacket at this point Mm -hmm. there are rumors that are swindling with all those teams is it possible and maybe looking at their depth right now they might want a guy like him for him to land on the Stanley Cup champion Tampa Bay Lightning yeah, potentially, definitely. Um, if only so he stops scoring like big goals against them. Um, but <laughs> so yeah, it was really funny. His first goal in two years came the other day against the Tampa Bay Lightning. His last goal was in Game One of the Stanley Cup playoffs in the series against Tampa Bay in 2019. So I think yeah, if only to stop him from scoring goals like that. But again, they're a team that like. You always think, oh, they're they're set, they're fine, they don't need to make any moves. And then they just do like little tweaks, like they'll upgrade their third pairing or they'll upgrade like upgrade their backup goalie and suddenly, you know, it just makes a makes a massive difference. So yeah, I could see them picking Savard up. And again, like he can play all night if he has to, but I could see him being the most effective, you know, if they use him sparingly. You mentioned Winnipeg as a destination. I know I'm just kicking rocks here. <laughs> but does it seem at uh, the point that the experiment is not working between Patrick Laine and Jordan, uh, John T- Tortorella? Do we at all hear maybe Laine's name being moved? Or is it maybe something that we could see maybe in the off season, Or maybe a, a tough year for the end of John Tortorella in Columbus? Yeah, I mean, so the the first thing is his contract is up mm-hmm. at the end of this season. I don't see a scenario in which we, in which we extend that contract or re-sign uh, Tortorella. I think he's done mm-hmm. in Columbus, regardless of what happens this year. If we, you know, make a massive surge, make the playoffs, I, I still don't think we see him. I think we, uh, I don't think we see him coming back. I think he's ready to retire. I think you know he's done what he needed to do. He's been fantastic for us for a few seasons now. Um, you know, he's taken this team of, I just call them like an island of misfit toys, and he's kind of made them into something that's more than the sum of their parts. But for whatever reason, this season has just has just not worked out. Um, I think with Line A, it's, it's a tough one because I don't necessarily know um, if it's a coaching issue with Line A. Uh, I know there's been some comments that have come out in terms of like, we're trying to make him into a 200-foot player or a power forward, things like that, which is, you know, it's something he's just not going to be. Um but I think it's a case of Kekalein is really high on the guy. Uh, obviously, we gave up quite a big piece to get him. Uh, Dubois wanted out anyway, but I think Line was the best possible return we could have got in that situation. Um, and I think if only to try and kind of recoup the the loss of Dubois, I think Line stays till the end of the season at least. And I think we try and extend him. Uh, and I think we kind of see how he does next year with, um, you know, a full season of Columbus Blue Jacket hockey under his belt and with a different coach, most importantly, because I don't know necessarily that they're clashing heads. I think they're just clashing styles. Mm-hmm. You know, Tortorella's style is very defense-heavy, block shots, you know, things like that, and it just doesn't gel with with Line's, you know, I'm going to score 50 goals. Um, so hopefully, hopefully he has kind of a bit of a resurgence next year. But yeah, I don't... I don't know if there's you know many rumors out there about us trying to flip him, but I don't. I don't know that we 
we let go of line A so quickly. Um, I would be interested to see if we maybe try and recoup some of our losses on Max Domi, who has mm. not been who we expected him to be. Um, you know, he was a 70 point player a couple of seasons ago. And when we first, we, the foot trade first happened, I was like, I'll be sad to see Anderson go because Anderson's a phenomenal player. You know, we've seen that in Montreal this season. He's doing really well. Um, but Domi could have strengthened us down the centre, which is something we desperately needed. It's something we desperately need even more now with Dubois gone, obviously. Um, Miko Kovu's sudden retirement in the middle of the season. Riley Nash is now injured. That's three of our four centres that we started the year with are just gone. Um, and, you know, Max Domi was supposed to be this stabilising second-line centre that was maybe going to push Dubois and challenge him for the first-line centre. And then, you know, he's kind of played all over the lineup. I think he's playing centre at the minute, but I wouldn't expect that to last. You know, he was our fourth-line winger this time last month. So I don't know if we'd get much for him, but I I could see us maybe trying to flip Domi for a pick uh, just, again, to... Recoup, recoup some of that loss and also to not pay him $5 million for the next two years. Mm. Nick Felino is a top veteran that possibly a lot of teams could want on their team. What kind of leadership does he bring a contending team if he's one to go out there? I So I keep hearing these rumors and every single time I just like put my fingers in my ears and I'm like, la la la, I can't hear you because mm. I don't want... I don't want Nick Foligno to to be traded um, like on an emotional level as well. Like I've been following the team since early 2014 when, you know, we were, we were really bad. And Nick Foligno is one of those guys that he's been there the whole time I've been a fan of the team. And he just kind of exemplifies Columbus hockey to me. Um, you know, he's such a great guy. The city loves him. The team loves him. Um, and I think he just kind of brings that. He's got a, a, a lot of energy that you don't get from a lot of players, I don't think. Um, I have heard nothing but nice things about him. Like, I'm lucky enough to to know a couple of ex-pros, and, you know, they've, they've met him, they're friends with him, they grew up uh, in Sudbury, Ontario, where he grew up, and, yeah, they've got nothing but nice things to, to say about him. And I think he's just an all-round, like... He's just a guy that has fun in the locker room. You know, again, he's not one of those guys that's going to go out and he's not going to have another 30 goal season like he did in 20, uh, 2015, I think it was. But he adds maybe 10, 15 goals in a good year. I think he can play center. He kills penalties. He's one of those guys that can just kind of do everything pretty well. Um, you know, you can stick him on the power play if you if you need a little bit of extra like size on the power play and so i think there's a lot of teams that would be like yeah okay well nick felino is one of those guys that is not going to change the roster he's not going to change the team but he's one of those like just a little tweak a little upgrade that again a, t- a team like tampa would probably really benefit from i've heard a lot of rumors about him going to toronto uh but i don't know how much of that is like actual rumor and how much of that is just the typical Toronto thing of every time there's an expiring contract on a guy that was born in Ontario, they're like, Oh, well, obviously he's going to come home. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see him end up in Toronto. He's exactly the kind of player that they would go for in, in that kind of scenario. You know, they've got Joe Thornton, they've got Wayne Simmons, they've got Jason Spezza. But to that point, I wonder if they are kind of all full up on, you know, like aging veterans that are there for leadership more than more than points. Um, but I, I don't think we'll trade him. You know, he's he's our captain. He's incredibly important to the team, and I think, you know, his contract expires at the end of this year. Obviously, he's a UFA, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him sign another contract with us, but for much less money. You know, his family is in Columbus. He clearly wants to stay in Columbus. He loves it as much as we love him. So. Um, you know, there are teams that would want him, obviously, but I don't, I don't see him moving. Before you go, uh, what kind of blow would it do to the team and what would occur if Savard or Felino or even both of them leave this organization that they've been a part of for nine or 10 years, respectively? Is, are they, are they then maybe, is it the R word? Are we in a rebuild mode then too? I don't know, I've heard this kind of thrown around a lot, but the thing about a rebuild is, you know, 
I've kind of been watching, I kind of am a, I would say I'm a part-time Kings fan. Um, and they've kind of been going through the rebuild for a, for a year or two now, and they got rid of a lot of their pieces. We just don't have a lot of rebuild trade pieces to give up. I don't think like a lot of our guys are part of that young core that we would want to keep, you know, like Seth Jones is one of the oldest guys on the defense, on the defense. And he's 26, 27, you know? So it, it kind of gets to a point of like, we can rebuild, but we haven't got anyone to get rid of, you know, like Nash is on an expiring contract. Del Zotto's on an expiring contract. Uh, Savard, Felino. Those are really our only kind of guys that we could get rid of for, you know, anything. But everyone else, like Atkinson, he's signed to a long-term deal. I don't think you want to get rid of him. Bjorkstrand, I don't think you want to get rid of. Um, Jones, Wierenski, you know, these are all pieces that you would want to keep. So I I, don't know, I think it's been such a weird season. Um, and it's not the season I expected when we came into it. But I don't see us tearing it all down yet i think we just write it off as a bad year especially you know considering we're probably gonna have a new head coach next season i think just you know the team is not bad they're just performing badly which seems like a little bit of a like a contradiction in terms but sometimes good teams have bad seasons and i think that's kind of where where we were at for a minute i wouldn't be surprised if the blue jackets look like a completely different team next year but are functionally the same on ice players you can find him on Twitter at Jay the Goalie. Thank you for stopping by, Jay. No problem. Happy to be here. I want to thank all our guests from today's episode. It's been a blast. It's been great. Even messaging all my insiders from all the teams, there's been a lot more guys discussing who could be moved. And I had to trim it down to seven guests. And thank you all for joining me. And thank you for the continued support for our team at Jablam Sports and for joining me. It was great talking to you guys. Uh, it's going to be an interesting year at the deadline. So stay tuned for that. And of course, next week, we'll be talking about the big container uh, contenders that added some big impact players. So check that out next week. Remember, if you've enjoyed anything you've heard in this episode or don't, please tweet at me or even our guests. You can follow me on Twitter at Russia 98 or the entire team at Jablam Sports. If you want, you can also contact us on our website. Uh, you can use the hashtag at Jablam Sports, uh, Jablam Sports, that's J-A-B-L-A-M, and our website is jablamsports.com slash contact for our contact page there. Please check out our website, go to jablamsports.com to see all our podcasts and even game notes for each episode, including this one, and you'll get our guests' info and links to things we mentioned on this show. Please subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify. And of course, click on the three dots in your podcasting app and share this episode with three friends you know. Please and thank you. Also, follow us on our Facebook group, Jablam Sports. Check us out, folks. Thank you, everyone. And to every one of our listeners, I'm giving you a virtual hug. Stay healthy, listen, be yourself, and stay strong. Dun, 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 dun.